morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the introduction to the Residential Transit Pass. Uh, my name is Michelle Leonard. I am the Outreach and Programs Manager at Community Services, and I am joined today by our presenter, Michael Krantz, TOD from Metro, Acting Program Manager, TOD from Metro Transit. Good morning. Come on in, get yourself settled in, and we'll just keep rolling here. Um, this morning, we're going to just kind of take a quick look at our agenda. We'll do a welcome tour this morning from Ridgefield's Mayor, Mary Simple. And then we'll hit a little bit about commuter services. We'll do an introduction to the res residential transit pass, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Now, to start this morning, I would like to introduce you to the City of Ridgefield new mayor, Mary Supple, who will give us the greeting. Uh, mayor, mayor Supple was elected to the Richfield City Council in 2018, and she was elected as mayor in 2022. She has been one of Richfield's two representatives on the I-494 Corridor Commission since February of last year. With that, I'll let Mayor Supple make some comments. First of all, welcome to Richfield. We are very pleased to partner with Community Services to spread the word about Metro Transit's residential transit pass. We all know that access to transit leads to economic security, and economic security in turn leads to housing stability. And so that's something that we're looking forward to. We want to promote that housing stability and promote um, access to jobs and access to transit. So thank you for coming out and helping us to spread the word. Thank you, Mayor Supple. So many of you are familiar with the purpose and mission of commuter services, but we are recording this presentation, and so we'd like to share just a little bit of information about the work that we do for those who may not be familiar. Um, Commuter Services is the outreach program of the I-494 Corridor Commission, and we are one of five transportation management organizations in the state of Minnesota. The Corridor Commission was formed under a joint powers agreement between the cities of Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Edina, Minnetonka, and Richfield. And we now work with employers, commuters, and residents to within our member cities to promote sustainable commuting options, including bike commuting, carpool, telework, vanpool, guaranteed ride home, and of course, today's hot topic, bus transit and light rail transit. And you will find an a, uh, overview of all of our commute resources in the folders that are on the table or that Robin is dropping off for you. So, commuter services supports the residential transit pass in a number of through a number of resources, and these resources are also used uh, how we support bus and light rail transit overall. Today is our first public introduction to this program. So, going forward, we'd like to work with our member cities as well as owners or managers of multifamily housing. And if appropriate, developers bringing new multifamily housing to the area. We have a number of tools at the ready to help roll out the residential pass and meet with developers or property management to introduce our program. We are available to set up information sessions or commuter fairs to help residents understand how the pass program works for them. We can provide residents with customized transit route itineraries to help them schedule transit rides to and from work. We can provide metro system brochures, transit system maps, and individual route maps. And we are always ready and available to do demonstrations on how to mount a bicycle on the front of a bus. Um, you may be familiar with some of these terms and acronyms, but sometimes folks aren't, so I just wanted to bring a couple up in front of you. If you see RTP, that is the Residential Transit Pass that we are talking about. 
TOD is transit oriented development, which creates compact mixed use communities near transit where residents and commuters have easy access to jobs and services. TDM is transportation demand management, or also it goes sometimes by transit de demand management. This brings together policies, programs, information, and services that support the use of current infrastructure with the goal to enhance sustainable commuting and cut back on single occupants vehicles, which is down on the bottom. And finally, the TMO, the Transportation Management or Organization of which the I-494 Corridor Commission and its outreach program, Commuter Services, is one of five TMOs in the state of Minnesota. So our speaker will go into a lot more detail, but I just wanted to hit a couple high notes about the Residential Transit Pro Pass Program. It is a new Metro Transit Fair product designed to help managers of properties and developers meet TDM goals and reduce the cost of parking construction. It also helps participating properties attain and retract, I'm sorry, attract and retain tenants. The RTP will also help cities meet sustainability goals, lessen traffic and parking on city streets, and promote another tool, provide another tool for transit-oriented development planning. As you learn through our presentation, the Residential Pass program has potential for far-reaching benefits. Uh, of course, the residents of the multifamily housing will reap benefits of cost-effective transit and transportation security, but there are also positive implications for property owners and managers, multifamily developers, and the community as a whole. We'll start with a few of the benefits to residents. Now, again, our presenter, Michael, will dig into some of these topics a little bit more, but I just want to point out, residents can save up to $1,400 individually, annually, on the cost of a transit pass through this program. Resident, the pass is unlimited use, which means that residents who use it can also be trying transit to work, to school, running errands or just going out and having a little fun. Um, the communities will have less traffic and the pass is in the form of a go-to card, which is a fare card and this card refills automatically each month. So that eliminates some of the anxiety that users would have about finding the money to put more money for more into their go-to card. Now, the residential pass, also, residential transit pass also helps developers and property managers. This is a new building amenity that can help track, attract and retain tenants. Tenants who use the pass will spend significantly less on transportation, which may help them to better make their rental payments in full and on time and your development becomes more equitable, more affordable, and more sustainable. As you can see, communities will also benefit in multiple ways. Neighborhoods will experience less traffic and improved air pollution, or I'm sorry, <laughs> less traffic, less air pollution, and improved air quality. Neighborhood, local traffic makes use of transit safer for everyone, and foot traffic will increase in smaller businesses. And of course, you'll find that transit brings some accessibility to folks who are aging or disabled. And with that, I'm going to step aside and let Michael take the lead here, um, and we will have questions after he's finished. Thank you. So, as Michelle mentioned, I'm Michael Kranz, Acting Program Manager of Transit-Oriented Development at Metro Transit. I'm going to be talking uh, about the Residential Pass Program, which is a very new program for us. We launched it at the be uh, beginning of last year. But first, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Mayor Supple and uh, the City of Richfield for hosting this and for uh, Commuter Services and, and Michelle for organizing this event. Um, so, the, oh, this is a little bit more sensitive than I 
years. Um, and then anybody who's paying for transit on a per trip basis in orange on the left. So what you see is um, before the pilot and during the pilot, folks who had a monthly pass, their, their transit ridership didn't really change before and during. The economics of taking transit didn't change for them. But folks who were paying for transit on a per trip basis in orange, their transit ridership increased by 78%. There's a really substantial increase in transit ridership. We saw them taking it a lot more often because rather than paying for every single trip individually, that additional trip was free because they had an unlimited ride monthly pass. And we also saw folks who reported never taking transit in gray on the right start taking transit again because monthly passes are a really effective way to reduce barriers to taking transit. It's just you don't have to worry about trying to figure out what fare you need. You've already got it on your pass. All you have to do it is tap and board. Um, so this is, this is why we decided to, to move forward with a permanent program. Um, and this is also, uh, I think, why we went with the structure that we did. We wanted to expand access to monthly passes, get, it, get them in as many hands as we could. So how does this work? Um, from a property owner, property manager perspective, uh, we would sign a contract with the property owner or property manager for one to five years, which locks in that price over that period. Um, the property owner owns the passes, so technically it, it is a feature of the building. It doesn't go with the residence, it goes with the building, um, which I think is a really important aspect of this. Um, and again, it's, it's that one pass per unit uh, limit. Um, and then they have the ability, similar to the way it works with MetroPass, property owners have the ability to manage those passes through a portal. Uh, so they would get access to a, a portal that would allow them to assign what units receive each transit pass, and then as a tenant leaves, they would be able to cancel those passes. As new tenants come in, they can order new passes for those, uh, for those residents. Uh, so it really is designed to be an amenity of the property. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, we can help provide uh, marketing support where that might be helpful. Maybe there, there's a desire for a, a lobby poster or an email blast or, or other features. We, we can help pull together those materials, and that was something we did during the, uh, the pilot program that was really helpful just to increase awareness. I mean, if, if properties are providing this as a benefit, they want to make sure that their tenants are aware of it uh, and that they can realize those benefits. So that's, this is, that's an area where we can support. Um, one other thing that we sometimes do is uh, we can program lobby TVs to provide real-time transit information. Um, so uh, residents don't have to go outside to wait. They can, they can see when the next uh, bus or train is going to arrive. So that's, that's a, another way that we can support this, but there's, there's a lot of support that we can provide um, for property owners interested. Uh, so we did, we did a few surveys uh, during the pilot program. Uh, that first survey to identify how folks were using transit beforehand, but also we wanted to get feedback from residents after the fact to see what their experience was using transit. How were they using it during the pilot program? Um, so this was part of the exit survey. We wanted to see how they were using the residential pass um, during the pilot. Uh, work was a, a huge part of that. It always has been, but I think what was surprising for us was how often folks were starting to use that transit for non-work trips. I mean, previously, work would have been the dominant story on this map uh, before the program. There, people would pay for it for the, the work trip to work, but they weren't using it for, for other services. But we saw uh, our residents start using it more for errands and entertainment and these other trips that happened in off-peak periods, which is, I think, one, it's, it's helpful to see that it's, it's more valuable for these other types of trips. Um, but it was good for us because that's also when we have the most capacity on transit is during off-peak hours. So um, that was a really encouraging result. Um, and then we, we also asked a, a couple other questions related to did it impact how often residents were driving. So 50%, greater than 50% of the residents reported driving less during the residential pass program. So those additional transit trips were actually replacing uh, car trips. Um, everyone who responded to the excerpt survey said that they would choose a property that offers this amenity over one that does not, because it is a pretty valuable amenity when you consider how expensive it is to purchase an individual pass price. So it's uh, quite a bit of value. Um, actually, when we were talking to some of the property managers during the pilot program, um, they said that they had several tenants come 
and say, well, if you can guarantee I'm going to get this monthly pass, I will sign with your property over over a different one. So it was a, um, they, they were getting quite a bit of increased interest just during the pilot. Um, and then we saw, as I mentioned on the prior slide, a, a, a big increase in non-commute trips, and we were able to map that out as well. So um, evening trips and trips in the middle of the day to, to do non-work uh, travel. Uh, so I, I want to dive into what the benefits are from a renter perspective. And we've talked a little bit about these, but a, a lot of it really does come down to savings. Um, and these are ultimately benefits that uh, a property owner or property manager can use to sell uh, uh, to their uh, tenants or to prospective tenants. Uh, so the first one is that this program saves up to $1,400 annually on transit passes. Um, so anybody who's currently purchasing an individual transit pass, they're paying about $1,400 for one that covers the entire region, um, unlimited rides. Uh, and through this program, they would save substantially because it would be wrapped into uh, that property rent, uh, or it would just be $14 per pass per month. Um, they uh, save money on owning or operating a car. Uh, on, and I'll, I'll dig into some of those numbers. They can save money on parking because, I mean, $14 is comparable to a lot of event parking or downtown parking. Um, and then reduce carbon footprint, which is uh, an advertisement that I've seen more and more properties use, which is, uh, I'll, I'll provide some additional material on that as well. So this is uh, that comparison, so saving on transit passes. So um, the annual, the residential pass on an annual basis costs about $168 a month um, for the property owner. And I think one of the features I didn't talk about is how property owners have been managing that in the past. There are a variety of ways that they can manage it under the contract that we have. They could just wrap that into a utility expense or a rent expense or absorb it. I mean, property owners have taken all of those approaches so far. Um, and again, the, the individual go-to card is uh, over $1,400 a month. So it is really a substantial savings on an annual basis that residents uh, of these properties that are participating in this program would realize. And that's just from the individual uh, a transit pass, which is a fairly affordable form of transportation as it is. Um, it can save substantially on car, car ownership. Now, not everybody experiences all of these costs of car ownership. This is a uh, brand new survey from AAA on uh, cost of car ownership in 2022. Uh, and this is the residential pass program on an annual basis. It's, it's trivial. Any component of car ownership is more expensive than the re uh, residential pass on an annual basis. So again, not everybody's going to be buying a new car, but I mean, just look at the fuel expenses or the cost of insurance or the cost of maintaining a car. Um, all of those are far more expensive. And, and even if you still own that car, you can significantly reduce operating expenses if you're taking transit more frequently. So it's a significant savings uh, for folks who have access to a monthly pass. And ultimately, those are savings that make housing more affordable for tenants. I mean, rents have been increasing, and this is a great way to, to lower overall affordability by considering both the transportation and the housing side of that affordability question, which often takes 50% of a, a household's income. Um, there's also significant asso uh, savings associated with parking, as I mentioned. So this is uh, the cost, of, again, of the monthly residential pass. And this is, uh, we've got the cost of average downtown parking in Minneapolis, uh, $12 for a single day. Uh, going to the airport is about $18 for a single day. A uh, Twins game, uh, $15. Vikings games are closer to $35 for a single event. So that's a... Um, a month's worth of unlimited ride transit pass, uh, and you can save essentially pay for it by saving parking at any one of these uh, in, in any of these situations. So it, it really is a, just putting that in comparison. How much somebody pays to park at a single event is is pretty shocking, and, and you can save significantly. These are all locations that can be accessed via transit. Uh, so a, another way that it could potentially, and I've I've seen some of the properties advertise this as one of the benefits of providing this amenity is we've got a residential pass, so you don't have to pay for airport parking or downtown parking. Um, and then greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, this is something that we've been looking at a little bit more frequently. And some, some properties uh, advertise how green it is to stay at a particular location. Providing a residential pass is probably going to be the most impactful of, of all of those uh, things that you could do. So this is looking at total travel emissions, average travel emissions from a household that uh, takes 
public transit for 15,000 miles in a year or drives for 15,000 miles in a year, and it's substantially different. So taking public transit and providing a residential pass is a really impactful way to reduce carbon emissions in a, a particular location, more than probably anything else. Um, so just a, another, another potential selling point for uh, residents in a building. Um, so what are the, the uh, property owner benefits? And in this case, I mean, there, there are several. I think one of them is just the ability to attract new tenants um, from the savings associated with providing a residential pass. Um, the way we estimated where rents are today, a 1% reduction in vacancy would essentially cover the cost of participating in this program for an entire building, um, which is pretty substantial. Um, and it, it, uh, we've also, I, I've mentioned this, I, I don't know if I mentioned this during this presentation, but we have seen um, some property owners use, uh, with new construction, new construction use this as a way to accelerate lease up in a building, which can also uh, help cover the costs of the program. Um, it can really help reduce tenant turnover. There are uh, a lot of properties, I mean, there are some properties that are providing this, but it's a, a really valuable amenity that gets a lot of use. Um, and it can help reduce that tenant turnover, which uh, can be a savings for property owners. It can help meet TDM goals uh, where those exist uh, in cities. Uh, it can really increase affordability uh, for, for tenants. Um, and it can also help decrease traffic and alleviate parking shortages uh, for some of these properties that uh, have parking shortages. Participation in this program has helped attract tenants and maybe lower no car households. Um, so that's a, another potential uh, benefit of participating in this program. Uh, so what are developer benefits? This is, um, this really only applies in cases where this would be wrapped into a property during the early design or uh, construction phase, um, but it can help reduce capital costs associated with that project. Uh, as I mentioned previously, accelerate lease up, uh, help build neighborhood support. I think parking is often one of the most contentious parts of a uh, development proposal. Um, and saying that you're providing resident uh, a transit pass to everybody in a building might be a way to help uh, alleviate that based on some of our experiences uh, with neighborhood conversations. Um, and then again, help meet TDM requirements where that's part of the zoning process. Uh, so just quickly jumping into the parking construction, um, cost of building parking, uh, I saw in a recent survey from last year, the average cost of structured parking in an apartment building is about $30,000 uh, per stall uh, to build, which is which is really substantial. And when you look at the cost of financing with today's interest rates, that's about 179 per month just to cover the, uh, the um, cost of financing and building that parking. So it's significant. Um, and 12, building one less structured parking stall would cover the cost of 12 residential passes over a 30 year period. So just building a, a small, uh, slightly reducing the, the volume of parking in a building would help um, cover a, a residential pass. And we've, we've talked to some property owners about doing a longer term agreement. I think what we've seen uh, from developers is that um, maybe if a city requirement isn't driving the parking requirement, lenders may be in certain cases and participation in this program over a long period of time might uh, make a, a lender more comfortable uh, allowing less parking in that property. So this is a, another way to, uh, option that we're looking at to help um, reduce the, increase the affordability of, of housing, but also uh, make it more affordable to participate in this program long term. Um, so just going uh, over those benefits at a high level. So it can, again, reduce those capital costs, help improve cash flow for a building by reducing vacancies uh, and uh, uh, reducing turnovers, um, reduce tenant turnover, uh, help amplify uh, that marketing pitch to, to new, to existing and, and prospective uh, tenants, and then also uh, potentially simplify that entitlement process. In some cases, that's not always going to work. It depends uh, on where the project is, but it can help with that process as well. So with that, I think we have some time for questions now. I got a, a handful of questions here. So you mentioned uh, this pass is good for um, limited use, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Gotcha. Um, 
And then if like a five-year contract were to be signed, is there like an increase in the annual fee amount for those passes? I think you mentioned it's like $14 per unit per month. That, that's the, what the fee would be over the term of that contract. Okay, so it's like a flat rate fee over the five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a minimum number of passes that can be, that are required per property? So I know I think you mentioned that a property needs to be 10 or more units to qualify, right? Do they have at least 10 passes then per property or is there kind of a minimum threshold, I guess? Yes, yeah, based on the size of the property. So if, if it's a hundred unit property, it would be a hundred passes. So you need to do the full amount of passes for however many units you have. Yeah, it's based half yeah. of the amount of units or whatever. That's right. Okay. Oh. Um, does the property need to be within like a certain distance of like an LRT, BRT line, or does it? Line? Okay. Um, it kind of covers what I had here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. With the passes, how does it work if there's more than one household member that's taking transit? Do they only get the one pass per household? I mean, if you have like roommates. Yeah. So it goes with the unit. Uh, so only one person can use the pass at a time, but we're not tracking who in that unit is using the pass. Uh, so they, I mean, we've seen folks uh, share it. Sometimes um, what we've seen is, is households will have the, the monthly pass and then they'll have an extra go-to card, stored value card, to, if two people need to use it at the same time. Um, but yeah, just one per unit, uh, and they, they can share it. And you can't, can you reallocate between units if like my next door neighbor doesn't want to participate in the program and be absorbed elsewhere in the property, or are they required to keep their card even if they don't want to? So we, we don't apply any restrictions. So we give 100 passes to a property owner, and then they get to decide how they manage those passes. Okay, so a property could decide to give two passes to one unit and zero to another if that's the way the residents manages. Yeah, and that's really within their discretion. Yeah, we were all, I mean, we, we just established that bulk threshold to determine when they qualify for this, uh, for the discount, um, but ultimately they get to decide how they, how they manage it. Yeah. How does that like portal set up kind of work? Can you explain more about that on the yeah. property management side? Yeah. Um, it's like thinking about how like, you know, if a tenant leaves the property and a new resident signs on, all that, you know, process of transitioning that pass to the new resident might work. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are varying levels of detail. It depends on how much uh, a property manager wants to put in there. But the way it's essentially set up is you would have the serial number for each transit pass in this portal, and you would assign what unit each of those serial numbers went to. So you would know who has what pass. And then if, um, if one of those tenants leaves, you could, through that portal, just click on that particular serial number, cancel it, and then just order new passes. And obviously, because, I mean, the fee is fixed at one pass per unit, you or you would have, probably have some extra uh, transit passes. We typically provide additional transit passes for to handle that turnover. And then you just insert the new serial number in that portal, assign the, uh, the unit that it's with, um, and then hand it out to the, the new resident when they come in. Is that pass like a physical pass then, or is it like on, on the phone, or how does that work? I yeah, it's a physical pass. Okay. And then, sorry, so to, to go back to one thing, I think you kind of already answered it, but so if like, there's like a 100 unit property, for example, you need to do 100 passes, we couldn't do like 50 passes, or less than 100 passes, then you need numbers. That's right, okay. yeah. Southwest Transit. How does that system play with the physical pass and then also um, the term ability to service the residents? Yeah, uh, so it does not work with Metro Mobility. So it, it's, it's completely separated from Metro Mobility, um, as, uh, which is true for a lot of the, the pass, uh, the monthly pass products like Metro Pass. Um, and then, but it is a, just a standard go to card. So my understanding is that it works. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, we met with Southwest Transit a couple of weeks ago and did confirm that the, for their fixed route service now with Southwest Transit, um, you know, they run their prime service, for instance, to Normandale Community College. And in that case, it doesn't work for prime. Um, 
because that's kind of, you know, along the lines of an Uber or something like that. But it does work for the fixed route, and it does, it is applicable for, say, they take the bus out of Eden Prairie to another site where they would connect with something in the Metro Transit. So that fare is, it's all covered under that sector, under that part. Through the Metro Mobility fare would still be paid separately. In that vein, I did get a question prior to today's event about um, whether there, <laughs> excuse me, if uh, some of the cities with their HRA programs or um, community housing, if this would apply toward like low-income or uh, city-owned single-family homes or something like that, uh, it is not applicable to single-family residents. And it's not intended to really fall under the like the housing choice voucher or to to marry up with that program. Um, that is kind of separate. It's it's meant to work with that full residential or multifamily unit. So if an HRA per se owns a multifamily unit unit and chooses to enter into that contract, they would be treated as the property manager. But they would not, um, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is there wouldn't be any, like, you get a, there's a discount or anything like that just because it's a city-owned property. That said, in conversations with our contacts at Metro Transit, it's not out of the realm of possibility of something being developed someday that would work for um, the the housing like that, but um, right now nothing exists. And if there is a city that is interested in that, we can work with Metro Transit to kind of set up that concert because that's how that's how the residential paths came. We, that there was a there was a there was a need and so if that's something that a city is interested in pursuing, we're happy to work through that with Metro Transit. Do you work with condos? Yeah. Okay. I mean ultimately we would have to have a single contract. We couldn't have a contract with every single condo unit. So whoever does the property manage management would want to have a contract with this. But yeah. Okay. Do you mind going in more into detail about the pilot program? Just in terms of like, what were the where were the properties located? Because suburbs, you know, it's different with access, especially in Minnetonka. Yeah. Uh, so we had one along the high frequency 10 up in the city of Fridley. Uh, we had um, one in the city of Minneapolis along the blue line close to the airport, uh, and then one along um, the green line uh, in St. Paul. So that, that was kind of the spread. I guess there were, there were two, three buildings in Fridley. Um, fairly large structures in, in Frisley that, that participated. Uh, so that was kind of the spread that we had. Um, and I, I mean, it doesn't we, it doesn't have to be high-frequency transit, but we saw that as kind of the natural uh, market for the program. Yeah. Was there, I guess this may be hard to answer, but, you know, thinking from our perspective out where there isn't high-frequency transit, you know, would people actually be, like, would property developers be interested in having this when it's not as accessible um, out there? You know, we have the green line coming, but that's not going to be done in yeah. the Opus area that it's being done <laughs> until, like, 2027. So yeah. it's, you know, trying to see what's there, like, especially, I guess, in Fridley would be the mm -hmm. yeah, that Was there more success than before, or? I mean, it does have access to high frequency service now at the, the local Route 10, and it was getting quite a bit of use from that area. I mean, one of the things that we uh, did have done in a couple cases is help create surveys for property owners that are interested in exploring that so they could get a sense for how often their tenants are using transit. Um, and then we can provide information on how that changes during the pilot program because we did see an increase in the transit ridership once those uh, were provided. So if there is a significant, if a lot of the residents are, are headed downtown and taking transit at some time, even if they're not immediately on a transit line, that that might still make sense. And we can, we can help provide that information and coordinate it. 
we, we're kind of aware of that too. Um, I mean, the demographics, the, the density, and the routes for we're existing with Metro Transit in particular, and, and you know, in Tonka, you really are, um, don't have nearly as many roads running through as, say, a Ridgefield or Bloomington. Um, so we're aware of that, but also looking to the future and when the Green Line extension does reach completion, um, <laughs> it, you know, we're also aware that the cities of Minnetonka and Prairie are planning a lot of, of high-density housing nearby. So this is just something, as in your conversations, this is kind of why I wanted to have the cities involved. As you're looking at your three, five-year plans, and things like that, um, this is a topic that you can approach as you're meeting with developers of those newer high-density. Because um, I know a lot of you guys are, you're, you're going up, you're not going out anymore. So there are three buildings on that where that line is right now in construction, so it's right. big, right. massive, 200 so it's, yeah, it's just something to it's just something to kind of give you the information that you can approach it with developers or property owners as as the projects come to fruition. I'm in Edina. I used to be near. There was a rapid transit route that went right down Valley View, and it was so great. And I would take it to work when I was working in town, and now that's gone. And then the one that used to sail down Woodhill is gone. And now, in order to catch a bus, I need to go down the 60 second. And I'm wondering, is this concept something that potentially can be used to bring some of those lines that have disappeared back? Or is that That's a good question. Could the residential pass drive transit frequency in a particular location? I, I think it would depend on how many properties are participating particular area so that that's part of it I mean ultimately the frequency conversation is driven right now for Metro Transit by driver shortages and right. the struggles hiring and that's really starting to turn around we're starting I mean we've had a lot more success over the past couple months uh, at our hiring events but I mean driver shortages are industry-wide and not not specific to Metro Transit but, so that's I think more than anything that's really what's driving uh, the lack of I mean some of the reductions in frequency that we've seen uh, and Hoping as quickly as we can to return uh, a lot of those routes to their, their high frequency levels. Yeah. And council member, um, the other thing is, is that Metro Transit is they, they change their uh, their routes approximately every three months. Uh, so the biggest, you know, the big there was those big round of cuts that came in December, and it was headline and all that. But what's what it, what it looks like when we hit, no, when we hit um, next month, we'll, we'll know more about what's gone or what's coming back. Um, and as Michael mentioned, it's always kind of contingent upon the usage and the, and the drivers. So. Oh, so you, so you understand that. I know when you say like every three months, <laughs> what's the pick that's coming yeah. up? So. Yeah. But I think, I mean, long term, assuming the driver shortage is uh, addressed and we're able to, to provide more of that service that we want to, I, I could see if, if concentrations of properties are participating in the residential pass, I could see that potentially long term being a, a driver of frequency. Okay, so we're going to Did we have any other questions? All right, well, then I guess um, with that in mind, I will conclude this event for today. I appreciate everybody who was able to make it. Um, we are recording this, so uh, we'll be sending out a copy to the a link to this again and also the slides sometime in this coming week. And if you have any questions or you're interested to learn more about the process to start a contract, please contact me. My phone number is, our office number is 952-405-9425. And my email address is mleonard, that's M-L-E-O-N-A-R-D, at 494core.org. I appreciate you joining us this morning, and um, 
this is uh, going forward, I'll be the primary contact for this. So please reach out to me if you have more questions.